Uh, well, good morning, everybody. Thanks to those who took part in that first half. It was great midweek to meet as one big life group. I was really encouraged by that. There were so many people on uh, this time. Uh, I hope you were encouraged too. We'll do that again sometime. Uh, this Saturday evening, we have another fun night over Zoom penciled in. Look out for info uh, midweek for that. Well, we're back in Luke chapter 15 uh, today. We were here last time when we looked at the parable of the lost sheep. If you remember the context of the passage there, the Pharisees had criticised Jesus for eating with sinners. And Jesus responded with the story of the lost sheep to explain the gospel. The truth that we all like sheep have gone astray from God, but he loves us so much that he gave Jesus so that we could return. The Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. And actually, there were three lost parables in Luke 15. The, the lost sheep, as we've heard, the lost coin in the middle, and the story of the lost or prodigal son, as we will look at today. We hear it in the kids' talk and the Bible we read in. It's a story of ups, a story of a son who settles up, who packs up, and then he goes and lives it up. But then he becomes hard up, and he's fed up. And then eventually he looks up, he owns up and goes back to his dad where he's dressed up. The calf is fattened up and then they all party up. A story of ups. But at the heart of this story is it's a story of repentance. And I know we've touched on this quite a bit as we've been going through the parables, but we've been moving quite fast. Can you believe that this is our ninth parable? It's been great as well, but this parable offers us the chance to slow down and to think through some of those terms we've been using uh, and take a bit more time to understand what repentance is. So that's what we're going to do. I want to look at four things repentance is. Number one, repentance is understanding sin. Number two, it's knowing our condition. Number three, it's an honest confession. And number four, it's returning to God. And what I want to do is try and get through two of those points this week and the other two uh, next week. So there's the challenge. Let's jump in. And uh, number one, repentance is understanding sin. I wonder what is our understanding of sin? I've given some definitions over the weeks, but I've also said that it's a discussion that's been going on. Well, really forever. What is sin? The ancient Greeks particularly liked this debate. One of those, Protagoras, said man is the measure of all things. He argued that nothing was inherently right or anything inherently sinful. And people judge what is right or wrong or society judges what is right or wrong. Now, some could get on board with Protagoras, but the mo for most, it's hard to believe because really we know deep down that there are things that are wrong which nobody ever told us were wrong. And although there are differences between cultures, there are still things which are wrong in nearly every one. Murder is bad generally wherever you go. Harm in a child is generally not acceptable in most cultures. So to say there is no thing as sin or wrong doesn't really sit right with us. And it certainly didn't with lots around the time uh, of the Greeks. Two heavyweights, Socrates himself, he said he was trying to live a good life. And the only way he felt a good life could be achieved is to know what good and evil were. He said good and evil were absolutes to be searched for. His friend Plato agreed. He said we know what good is because there is somewhere out there an ideal form of goodness. Now, Socrates and Plato weren't believers uh, in God, uh, but we can get a bit more on board with what they say. We do believe that there are absolutes, good and evil. We can even say what we've been learning about uh, being able to show love because we've shown love and being able to forgive because we've been forgiven kind of fits in with what Plato was saying. And Plato, we'd say, look to God to know what good is. Some Christian philosophers and theologians jumped on what they were saying. Augustine was one of these. He said, yeah, God is good and all good things come from God. If you want to know good, you look to God. 
And Augustine said, what sin is, is the absence of this good. No good equals sin. And whilst I think this moves us on the right track, I believe this parable helps us to push this understanding even further. In this story, the son actively decides to leave his father. The son didn't just not do what was right, he chose to do wrong. But what did the son do? What was wrong with asking for his inheritance at this point? Well, here's three things that was behind what he was asking, I believe. Number one, he was saying to his father, I no longer trust your provision for me. I want to make the decisions of what I get myself. Secondly, I believe he's saying to his father, I no longer trust that you want what's best for me. I want to come out from under your rule and under your protection. He doubted his father's love for him. And thirdly, he was saying, I no longer want to be in relationship with you. It would be better for me if you were dead. It's the opposite if you've ever received an inheritance, but wished you could give that inheritance all back to get the person back. The son is the opposite. He doesn't love the father. He just cares for what he would get if he was dead. You see, one of the ways I've described sin over this series is as rebellion. And I believe we clearly see that here. The son rebels against his father. He rebels against his provision, against his love and against his rule. He rebels against what the father thinks is best for him. And this is what sin is to us. One writer described it like this. The sinful nature is such that it wishes God was dead and that it did not have to live according to his law. The nation of Israel in the Old Testament were often called rebellious. Why? Because they were just the same as the son here. God had provided for them. He'd given them his law. He'd led them. But quite often they would turn to other idols. They wanted what other nations had. They wanted their own rulers. They wanted to do what they saw right in their own eyes. They rebelled against God. But you see, that is sin. From the very first time where Adam and Eve chose to disobey God, to not listen, to question if God loved them, if God knew what was best for them or wanted what was best for them. They chose to rebel. And it's been the same for everyone since. God says this is my way, the best way, the right way, the way that's best for you. And we say, no thanks God. I'll go it alone. I'll do it my own way. We rebelled. Sin is rebellion. Let me work through an example with you to show this as well. An example we hear about in the news a lot at the moment is that of racism. Racism is sin. But why? Why is it sinful? Well, it's sinful because it's rebellion against God and his way. In the beginning, God made people and they were his and he loved them. He made them in his image. There are no groups or different kinds of people, no degrees of people. They may have looked different, but were all the same. And it's the same today, people made by God and loved by God. And we see God's heart for all people continue through the Bible. God's promise to Abraham is that through his family, he would bless all nations on the earth. His promise to King David that from his family, well, he would bless the nations. But you may ask, didn't God choose one nation for himself? Well, yes, Israel were called God's people. But even that, what was the purpose? Psalm 67, 1, may his face shine upon us, Israel, that you, that you may be known on earth. Your saving power among nations. Israel was supposed to show the world a loving, wonderful Heavenly Father, but they failed by keeping God to themselves rather than showing it. When Jesus came, he started to put this right. He broke 
all racial boundaries. He sat with the Samaritan woman at the well and shared the good news of the gospel with him. The doctrine of the church developed through the New Testament shows that there is no place for racial boundaries. No Jew, no Greek, but all are one in Christ Jesus. And all this leads through to that wonderful picture in Revelation. At the end time when people are gathered round the throne of God. What people? People from every tribe and tongue and nation and people group. So do you see God's heart for people? For all people. So therefore to discriminate against someone else because of their colour of, the, of their skin. To persecute someone else because of where they were born. Or to think that you're above someone else because of what it says on the passport. Is to rebel against God. Against his character. And against what he says is right. It's rebellion against God. It's sin. And we could do this with all types of wrong. Trace them back to how they rebel against God, his nature and his law. We haven't got time to do that this morning, but I encourage you to think that process through with other things. You will see, like we see with the sun in the story, that sin is rebellion. Sin says, God, I do not want you or your ways. I will live my life like you do not exist. And it's a rebellion that we all have made. For all have sinned, the Bible tells us, and fallen short of the glory of God. So firstly, sin is, uh, repentance is understanding sin. Secondly, though, it's knowing our condition. Knowing the condition we are in as a result of that rebellion. And for the son in the story, life first appears good. But this life comes at a financial cost. The money is going down. But actually we don't know how he's feeling at this time. Perhaps he's questioning even at this party time if it's all, crack, uh, all cracked up to be. Perhaps he's trying to block out the thoughts that his friends are only round him because he's buying the drinks. Perhaps he might already be questioning that reckless living isn't satisfying. But soon it all comes crashing down. The money is gone. The support is nowhere to be seen. And his survival is dependent on feeding pigs. Now, don't miss the impact this would have had on Jesus' Jewish audience. Pigs were unclean, the lowest of low. And here the son wishes to eat the food that the pigs are given. But he can't. Food is provided for the pigs, but no one provides food for him. And that's the position rebellion puts you in. Again, one writer says sin promises you tremendous riches, but it always pays with counterfeit money. We rebel from God. Sin promises freedom, but it drives you from a loving father and puts you in danger. Sin promises fulfillment, but it keeps filling with empty experiences that need constantly topping up. Sin promises identity, but it moves you further away from the person you were meant to be in God. Sin promises love, but it makes you chase meaningless relationships and breaks the ones that really matter. You see, repentance is understanding sin, but also seeing the condition it leaves us in. The Bible never says sin isn't as attractive as first. It describes it as the fleeting pleasures of sin. If there was no pleasure, then there wouldn't be any problem. We wouldn't be tempted. But repentance is acknowledging that they are fleeting, never fulfilling, leave you in a dark place far from God. I think Pip started our service the other week with words from Psalm 40. He drew me out of the pit of destruction, out of the miry bog. 
That is our natural condition without God. Verse 32 of our passage describes the son as dead and lost. And so were we. He had hit rock bottom. I know what we're good at sometimes seeing that in other people. Oh yes, I can see that applies to that person over there or in their problems. It's sad. But surely not me. That's not me. But remember who Jesus is speaking to in this story. He's speaking to the Pharisees. Pharisees who didn't think they were sinners and criticised Jesus for eating with the real sinners. And at this point, they're probably looking at the people Jesus is sitting with. Those whose lives may have taken a similar turn to the prodigals. And they're probably thinking, yes, listen up, you sinners. This is your condition. But look to the older brother, the one who stayed at home. He's completely different to his brother, law-abiding, presentable. A sinner? Well, yes, but surely not in the bog like his brother. But look again at the condition of the second son. Look where his sin has left him. He's angry. He's bitter. His relationships have been taken away from him. He resents his father and he won't even call his brother his brother. He's not working with joy and love, but he throws the fact that he's been serving all this time, almost slaving away, back at his father. There's no fulfilment in his life. He lists his brother's sins and there's almost envy in his voice as he does that, that he hasn't had the chance to devour possessions and property. He's bitter at the fact that he hasn't had a goat to celebrate with his mates, but it's blinded him to the fact that everything his father has is his. You see, this son too has rebelled, has sinned, and it's left him in an awful condition and he needs to see that too so he can repent he needs to see that he has sinned and rebelled and he needs to see that that has left him in an awful condition <laughs> well that seems like a really bad place uh, to end a preach but i've always said the good news of the gospel starts with bad news and if you were to seek help from a doctor the first stage would be to admit that you were ill and it's the same here this story shows us that the first steps in repentance is seeing sin in your life seeing that sin in your life is a rebellion against a wonderful and almighty god and that the condition that leaves us in is awful, far away from him in darkness. And if you are not a Christian today, I pray God will open your eyes to the truth of this. But it's the gospel of good news. It starts with that bad news. But spoilers, next week, the father is waiting. The son acknowledges his sin and his position and he heads back to the father. He's waiting for him. But the good news is that you don't have to wait. The good news is you don't even have to wait till next week. You can come to him today. The Bible says you will seek him and find him when you seek him with all your heart. Seek him with all your heart today. And Christians, listen then, we need to be wise about this sin. We need to understand sin. It helps us to see the world that we are in. A world that confuses us, frustrates us often. A world that seems so different to us. We need to understand it's in rebellion against God. And we need to see sin and acknowledge sin, not because the world tells us what is right or wrong, but to see right and wrong from God's word. To see what is against the character and the desire and the law and the nature of God. And then to act accordingly. We need to understand what sin is to take sin seriously in our own lives. 
We've been forgiven. Should then we continue in sin? Romans 6 asks, no, because we're in Christ. We're walking in newness of life. How then can we keep doing what is rebellion against our loving Father? Going against what he gives us. Going against what is best for us. Now we need to pray that the spirit of work within us helps us to tackle sin. To get serious about sin in our lives. You see, in understanding sin and understanding our position where we were before Jesus saved us also leads us to worship. For our heart to pour out in thanks, to say what a wonderful God you are, to save us when we had rebelled, to drag us out of the bog, to pull us out of the clay, to save us and call us children of God, should lead us to worship our wonderful Heavenly Father. Finish with some words from Psalm 51. Have mercy on me, O God, because of your unfailing love, because of your great compassion, blot out the stain of my sins. Wash me clean from guilt, purify me from my sin, for I recognise my rebellion, it haunts me day and night purify me from my sins and I will be clean wash me and I will be whiter than snow amen god bless you today